episode four of What's Up With The Economy. So what is up with the economy in the 21st century? So far, we've discovered that stagnant wages and the inability for a large part of the population to spend more than basic living expenses is holding the country's economy back. We've also seen that corporations and the people who run them are funding our lawmakers to keep wages low and create legislation that supports their own further accumulation of wealth. We have also seen that if wages increase for the lower 80% of the population, the economy could do a whole lot better for everyone. Well, in this episode, we're going to look at how climate change is affecting the economy. Climate change is huge, and it is changing our lives, as I'm sure you've noticed. First, some facts about the cause of climate change. Well, since man has harnessed fire as a tool, we've been releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in excess of what would naturally occur. And with all that combustion, we have released enough extra CO2 into the atmosphere to increase the density from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million over the last 135 years. Now, in the 50s, scientists began to understand the greater consequences as CO2 as a greenhouse gas. Very simply, CO2 lets light in, but not, does not let heat out. The result is that the global average temperature has increased 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 135 years. 2014 ranked as the warmest year on record. Now, a small change in temperature is changing the way the planet works. Precipitation is less in some areas, more in others. Polar ice sheets that influence the oceans, currents, sea levels, and weather patterns are rapidly melting. Animal migration patterns and plant life is all changing. So what does this mean for you? Extreme weather conditions of drought, hurricanes, rain, tornadoes, freezing winters, hot, dry summers will affect food supplies, water supplies, transportation, productivity, and global peace and security. For example, the drought in Australia destroyed one of the world's largest rice producing areas. And without that supply, rice prices increased and poorer nations in the Middle East that live primarily on rice, but do not produce much, became economically distressed and therefore politically unstable. This completed the perfect storm that triggered the Arab Spring in Tunisia in 2010 that spread throughout the region. Now the drought in California will affect producers' abilities to supply Americans with the fruits and vegetables that we rely on year round with 40% of the population getting government support and 45% of all children in low-income families, what is a food shortage going to look like in the U.S.? Risky Business, a think tank formed by some familiar people, Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City, Henry Paulson, former secretary of the Treasury, and Thomas Steyer, founder of Fairlawn Capital, studies the economic risks of climate change. They identified nine regional areas of loss and a Natural Resource Defense Council paper projects that in 10 years, the US will be experiencing about $411 billion of damages, costs, and losses due to climate change each year. That's projected to be about 1.9% of the GDP. This is a very interesting situation because we have government agencies, such as the Pentagon and NASA, pleading for government action on climate change, yet we have the fossil fuel industry funding our legislators at the national and state levels to deny, disprove, and silence any discussion of climate change facts. 97% of scientists agree that climate change exists, that is human-caused, and that it is going to get worse if we don't change our habits. We are learning that the few scientists who disagree have been paid to disagree. An economist of all people identified in 1975 that a 3.6 degree Fahrenheit increase in pre-industrial levels would take the planet outside of its normal temperature range. And with 1.4 degree increase since 1880, we are 39% of the way there, and we are already experiencing significant changes in the world. In order to stay within this temperature limit, the carbon budget for the next 40 years has been limited to 500 and 65 gigatons of CO2. Now at this time, there are 3,200 gigatons CO2 equivalent reserves that have been identified and proven by the world's coal, oil, and gas producers. 
Those assets are valued over at $57 trillion. 82% of those reserves are government owned. The remaining 18% are owned by the Carbon Underground 200. These are the top 200 companies with carbon reserves that you are probably invested in. The reserves belonging to these companies will produce about 555 gigatons of CO2 and are valued at about $10 trillion. If humans are really serious about preserving themselves and the ecosystem that sustains them, the carbon underground will be limited to burning only about 20% of those reserves. Now, when assets are no longer available due to changes in laws, they become stranded assets. The carbon underground will have to write off about $8 trillion of stranded assets, dropping the value of those companies by 40 to 60%. Now, 80% of those reserves is coal, which is mostly burning power plants. Now, replacing them with clean power generation would keep most of that coal underground. And we have the technology to do this. And in fact, in 2013, we added more solar than coal to global electricity production. But oil is going to be trickier to limit because transportation relies on it so heavily but something very interesting is happening. You know, just five years ago when we were talking about peak oil and predicting catastrophic effects of an increasing demand and a shrinking supply, but instead we are experiencing the opposite. Production has outpaced supply. In 2014, global supply sped up by 73%, but global demand actually slowed down by 41%. We are becoming more energy efficient. U.S. gasoline consumption dropped by 11% in the last 10 years, and we increase our output of renewable energy by about 5% per year. The U.S. demand for oil is back to what it was in 1998, and the current supply and demand equation has dropped the price of oil over 60% in just a couple of years. The crude oil price has been between $49 and $58 a barrel, while production costs average $90 a barrel. So check this out. Now, as an investment, fuel, fossil fuels have entered a new era of risks and markets are pricing these risks into their values. So here are the last five years prices of energy, coal, and oil compared to the Standard & Poor 500 Index and the New Alternatives Fund, a fund that invests primarily in renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies. You can see that after the crisis in 08, investors have begun to trim their investments in coal, oil, and gas and reinvest in clean energy technology. This chart is from the Fossil Fuel Free Index, a benchmark based on the S&P 500 with the U.S. fossil fuel companies removed. And comparing the Fossil Free Index to the original S&P 500, we can see that in the years of economic recovery since 08, the Fossil Free Index has outperformed the S&P 500 in those years of growth. Fossil fuel companies account for about 8% of the S&P 500, and we can see that they are dragging on the index. There are three main risks that carbon energy is now experiencing. First, there's industry risk. As the world becomes more energy efficient and produces more energy with clean technologies, the global demand declines and the price for oil and coal naturally falls. But the industry is behaving as if nothing is changing. The Carbon Underground 200 continue to spend about $670 billion a year on exploration. What they find could never see the light of day if it becomes a stranded asset. And this is wasted shareholder value. In fact, investors are asking companies to return profits as dividends and stop spending it on what could be futile exploration. Secondly, there is event risk. Now with even more pressure to get oil and coal out of the ground as cheaply as possible, we can expect to see more spills and disasters due to cost cutting, as was shown with BP, Anadarko, and Massey Energy, and a whole bunch more. Typically, a disaster will drop company share prices by about 50% and then add to that the legal expenses and fines. BP has spent $28 billion on legal fees, cleanup, and restitution, and still the settlement looks like it's going to be around $13 billion for the Gulf spill in 2010. These expenses all come from shareholder value. Then there's political risk. Collective global governments will be the power that limits what comes out of the ground. 
Since governments own 82% of the carbon reserves, what kind of political negotiations and fighting will pressure governments to lock up resources? What kind of geopolitical struggles can we expect? The Pentagon has identified 7,000 bases that will be affected by climate change, and as there are more frequent and extreme natural disasters caused by rising temperatures, greater demands will be put on our National Guard and military branches. As there are changes in food supplies and struggles among countries to adapt non-fossil fuel-centered economies, there will be national security issues to deal with. Will our government take national security seriously in regard to forbidding the use of carbon reserves? I ask this because the fossil fuel industry spends a lot of money on our legislators and it has been very lucrative for the industry. Let's look at the relationship between the fossil fuel industry and our own government. First of all, the social cost of climate change for the US of A has been identified by researchers at Stanford at $220 per metric ton of CO2. Now, releasing 5.3 billion metric tons of CO2 in 2013 cost us as taxpayers $1.16 trillion in external expenditures in associated healthcare, infrastructure, and military expenses. Add that to the subs government subsidies to the carbon industry in deferred taxes, deductions for cleaning up spills, exploration, intangible drilling costs, and more, that added up to $21.6 billion in 2013. So the total annual cost to U.S. taxpayers comes to about $1.18 trillion a year. This is an economic drag equivalent to 7% of the GDP. Not only is our government throwing money at one of the most profitable industries, but the government is bleeding money cleaning up the mess. In 2013, profits for the top five oil companies, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and Shell, came to $93 billion. And you could say that 23% of their profit came directly from taxpayers through government subsidies. How does this compare to our annual deficit, you ask? Government spending is over budget by $474 billion for the year. If real costs of oil were priced into the final product, two things would happen. We would use much less of it, and our country would be operating in a surplus. It is interesting to note that the effective tax rate for ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Conoco is only 20.3%. How do they get away with this? Now, according to Oil Change International, the 113th Congress received over $326 million in campaign contributions and lobby money. But for that, the industry received $33.7 billion in subsidies. And for $1 spent on legislators, the industry received $103 in subsidies. Here are the top 10 contributors for the lobby effort. These contributions come out of shareholder dollars. That's your money invested in these com companies that directly go to Congress or through a lobby group like the American Petroleum Institute or the American Legislative Exchange Council. Here's what that bought the industry. Attempts by Congress, some successful, some not, to deregulate pollution, health and safety, clean water, attempts to sell public lands and prevent new public lands from being formed and to allow mining and drilling in these areas, these are wilderness, national forests, parks, and monuments, some of the world's most favorite and fragile places on Earth. Attempts to expand the industry with new areas of drilling in Alaska and offshore and new subsidies in lower corporate taxes. Attempts to remove public input and environmental reviews from the legal process, and when there is a problem, companies cannot be taken to court defunding clean energy and energy efficient technologies. And my favorite are the attempts to make climate denial law and climate science illegal, making science that 1,100 scientists study and agree on illegal. That's like sentencing Galileo to house arrest for the rest of his life for saying that the earth revolved around the sun. But climate change denial has greater consequences. This is where it gets political and partisan. Of the 11,606 ballots cast 
favoring legislation that would benefit the industry and harm health of our people and resources, 96% were cast by Republicans. I want to take a moment to top, point out the top 10 recipients of this lob lobby money, and you can make your own conclusions. Now, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, 86% of the fossil fuel industry contributions went to Republicans. You've probably heard the phrase regulatory overreach. It's a popular phrase among Republicans on Capitol Hill right now, and it refers to deregulating your health and safety precautions, your clean water rights, your clean air rights, your public land rights, and the economic prosperity of this country. It is clear that corporations are using shareholder money to direct our legislative process. These are shareholder dollars, as in your dollars that are funding our Congress and influencing them to the will of corporate sponsors. The sellers control the rule makers. That is not a free market. On the other hand, this is no longer a democracy. And I say this because a number of polls show that the American people have different priorities than our elected officials. Given this list, compared to the actions of our highly funded Congress, can you tell who Congress is listening to? It's not you, is it? So how do we begin to change this? Vote. Vote at the polls, vote with your what you purchase, and vote with your investments. Consider this. Over $100 billion of managed assets has been divested from the Carbon Underground 200. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the family of the mother of all oil companies, Standard Oil, announced in September of 2014 that they were divesting from fossil fuels because there is more risk than return and it is the right thing to do. We cannot predict what markets will bring, but we can be prudent to the facts of a changing world that will affect the risk and profitability of an industry that happens to be the major contributor to our changing climate. The fossil fuel industry is wasting unreasonable amount of our nation's productivity, is experiencing a decline in demand, and has the potential of losing most of its value in stranded assets. Industries change as we become more educated, more enlightened, and are more responsive to our environment. Now looking back, aren't you glad you missed investing in slavery and whale oil? With over 11 gigatons of CO2 a year that we release globally, time is running out. The one thing that I think I can predict with certainty is that humanity is resilient and is determined to keep itself alive, which means that we will become more efficient, more productive, and we will do what it takes to preserve ourselves and the planet that sustains us. It is time to divest your portfolio from fossil fuels. Thanks for watching. If you would like to see the previous episodes, you can find them here. If you would like to subscribe to my YouTube channel, you can find it here. And of course, if you'd like any more information or like to have a conversation about your portfolio, please send me an email here. Eric Souders, Senate Financial. Thank you for watching.